he thought that the Soviets had spent years trying to deprive him of what he believed was rightfully his, the World Chess Championship. And he was going to Reykjavik, he was going to Iceland to teach the Soviets a lesson. Boris Spassky didn't understand where Fischer was coming from. He had tremendous respect for Fischer and tremendous liking for Fischer. But he did not understand that Fischer had come to Reykjavik to wage chess war. But Fischer's desire to politicize the match was quickly overshadowed by his reluctance to show up. Just minutes before he was scheduled to depart for Reykjavik, Fischer fled the airport and began making financial demands of the International Chess Federation. Bobby was very unsatisfied with the prize money. The size of the purse was small, so it didn't give sufficient weight to being world champion. Bobby Fischer wasn't going to play for $8,000, and he, he raised the ante to well into six figures. But even after the International Chess Federation raised the pot to $125,000, Fischer still refused to show. He claimed he was holding out for more than just money. If I were in just a personal gain, I wouldn't just be uh, taking up chess. You'd find your brain to something else, would you? Yeah, I would be in the stock market. This is where the personal gain is at. As the standoff dragged on, there were some who believed fear, not money or conditions, were keeping Bobby at home. He had a poor score against Spassky, had never beaten him, and, 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 and somewhere uh, he, he, had, he was losing confidence. With Fischer stewing in New York, officials in Reykjavik moved forward with the match's opening ceremony. The funniest thing is the opening of the match, with all the notables there, the president of Iceland and his cabinet, the president of the international chess body, Boris Spassky sitting there. There's only one chair vacant, and it's the challenger who is still in New York, trying to renegotiate the match agreement. The World Chess Championship had officially begun, but whether the match of the century would actually take place was anybody's guess. With his unprecedented run-up to the World Championship, Brooklyn chess prodigy Bobby Fischer had given America reason to believe that the Soviet domination of international chess would soon come to an end. But on the eve of the biggest match in modern chess history, Bobby Fischer balked. With the press selling the event as a Cold War contest of the highest order, politicians in Washington feared the Soviets would see Fischer's forfeit as a sign of American weakness. Bobby got a call from the White House. Henry Kissinger, the national security advisor, had to uh, intervene or felt the need to intervene, uh, trying to urge Bobby Fischer to play for America. He, uh, famously, he rang up in one telephone call and he said, this is the worst chess player in the world calling the best chess player in the world. With a little encouragement from Kissinger and more money put up by British businessman James Slater, Fischer finally agreed to play. Unlike his Soviet counterpart, Fischer brought next to nothing in the way of coaches and support staff. It was Bobby by himself. It was just amazing. And it was very colorful, very romantic when you think about it. The young kid on a white horse against the huge red machine. It captured people's imagination. But upon touring the venue where the match was to be played, Fischer reeled off an elaborate list of demands. He wanted the lights to be right, he wanted the chess sets to be exactly the, the proper size, the board had to be of a certain dimension. Not all of his demands had to do with the match, though. He demanded that the hotel keeper cook on duty 24 hours a day. Fisher wanted to play tennis on a moment's notice, we had to have a tennis player ready to play him. If he wanted to go bowling, we had to have keys to the bowling alley and a bowler who would go bowling with him. And, and then he didn't like the suite he was in, so they gave him another suite. Scrambling to meet his demands, the International Chess Federation postponed the start of the tournament for two days. This match was being covered by press like no chess match ever was before or, or since. I think there were at least at one point 200 journalists registered there. Norman Mailer came, Arthur Kessler came. People, writers from all over the world came to cover this event. At 5 p.m., Boris Spassky entered the Grand Hall and took his seat at the chess table. Spassky watched as match referee Lothar Schmidt started the game clock. The only problem was 
Spassky's opponent was nowhere to be found. You had this difficult, complex, uh, egocentric, monomaniac, semi-paranoid genius called Bobby Fischer, who was making demand upon demand upon demand. Nobody knew whether he was actually going to play Boris Spassky. Finally, six minutes after the match had officially begun, Bobby Fischer strolled into the hall and took his seat opposite Spassky. The match of the century was underway. But in the middle of the first game, Fischer noticed the camera crew situated at the back of the auditorium and flew into a rage. Bobby was very, very, very sensitive to the sound in the audience, even to the sounds of the, of the camera. Amid protests from both the Soviets and from American TV producers, match officials ordered the cameras out. Fischer returned to the table, but lost the game. When game two got underway two days later, Fischer did not appear again. The issue was the cameras. He complained that there was too much noise from the camera and basically uh, unilaterally uh, uh, breached the contract. He said, you can't have the camera here. They brought in Iceland's main noise expert and he measured the levels of noise both before the cameras were turned on and after the cameras were turned on and he said no human ear could pick up any difference. But Fisher insisted he could hear the cameras and that they were disturbing him. This time, match officials refused to cater to Fisher's demands. He refused to play that game too and he lost that game too. What was unclear was whether he was then going to turn up for game three. Down 2-0, Bobby would probably abandon the game. In fact, he'd already booked a flight back to New York. But after a second call from Henry Kissinger, Bobby agreed to return to the match, but only if the first seven rows of seats were removed from the auditorium. It still wasn't good enough, and more and more rows of seats had to be removed. And finally, there were 14 rows of seats left, and he said they got to remove seven more rows of seats. Incensed at the ongoing special treatment for the American, the Soviets finally put their foot down. The Soviets said, well, you know, this has gone too far. If you remove those rows of seats, Spatsky will leave. If Spatsky had simply taken his pieces and gone home, nobody would have criticized him in the least, but Spatsky was a gentleman too, and he wanted to play the match. With the most highly publicized match of all time in danger of total collapse, it was time for a compromise. The referee allowed them to play game three, not in the main hall, but in a small back room which was normally used for table tennis. With the cameras gone, Fisher finally turned his attention to the match and immediately went on the attack. It was Fisher's first victory over the world champ. Spassky was shell-shocked. It's my feeling almost that Fisher almost lost those two games on purpose to give himself an edge so that he would have something to really, truly fight for and then eventually show to the world. See, even though I was two games behind, which is a ridiculous in a World's Championship match, that indeed I could still win the championship with being two games behind. For game four, the match returned to the main hall, where Fisher wasted no time in exploiting his newfound psychological edge, winning five out of the next six games. Looking back, 1972 was a turning point in Cold War relations. President Nixon and Soviet Premier Brezhnev had opened new channels of trade and goodwill and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger had fostered a bona fide friendship with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. But on the tiny volcanic island of Iceland, the Cold War was more heated than ever. After a month and a half of head-to-head -head competition, eccentric American Bobby Fischer had world champion Boris Spassky on the run and his inspired play and outlandish behavior had made the match a global event. Well, the 1972 World Chess Championship made chess sexy for the first time ever. Back in America, Fisher's success was sparking unparalleled interest in chess. Imagine in 1972 what was happening. Uh, 